All right, okay. Uh, that's my tripod for this. It's my uh, my sneaker propped up on a shoe. Some pretty cool shadows there. Um, I am using a very high-tech um, tripod. I guess it's a monopod. <laughs> Monoped. Uh, yeah, because I cannot for the life of me um, figure out how to get my webcam to record on my new little laptop without uh, including a horrible, horrible hissing sound, which, I mean, is probably cool if you're going for um, horrible hissing sounds, but otherwise it's, it's not uh, not great. Anyway, um, so I wanted to um, put up a video for a couple reasons, and I wrote out a lot of text, which is an unusual thing for me to do, um, because I thought... Um, that the content might be of use to some folks and it would be better if Google can find it. And Google can't find um, the audio and videos perfectly yet. Um, and so I figured I might as well type some things up since I was uh, in an airplane flying to visit Christina's family, uh, which is where I am now, here in Hillsboro, California, outside of San Francisco. Um, so, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, ministry in the Religious Society of Friends. And I wrote out a lot of text, so um, feel free to read that. It might be a little bit more um, coherent in terms of step-by-step uh, -step explanations. But here goes. Um, I'm part of what's called uh, the liberal, unprogrammed tradition of the Religious Society of Friends. At least that's the way my congregation um, identifies itself, both with Friends General Conference, which is kind of a a sub-denomination within Quakerism. It's called FGC a lot of times. Uh, and uh, also through Friends United Meeting, which is um, another kind of one of those sub-denominations that uh, Quakerism split up into. Uh, there's four different uh, kind of branches, we say, of the Religious Society of Friends. There's the Conservative Friends. There's the um, Pastoral Friends. There's the Evangelical Pastoral Friends. And then there's the Unprogrammed Liberal Friends. And um, kind of by culture, in the very least, the congregation I'm part of is part of the unprogrammed liberal tradition. Now, myself, I often am associated with uh, kind of a more conservative perspective. A lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm a kind of confessional Christian, and um, the liberal unprogrammed friends tend to be a little bit more universalist. Uh, there's, of course, a continuum anywhere, but um, so that's my context. Um, so it is within that context and also meeting other folks who travel and do ministry work um, that I've kind of been, been formed. And so my understanding is shaped by all of that. Um, so ministry in the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers as a lot of folks um, call us, um, is a, kind of a misunderstood thing. A lot of folks say that we don't have ministers, which is absolutely incorrect. It's actually the opposite of that. We didn't abolish ministers. We abolished the laity. What we did do early on was to say that you don't accept money for ministry. And to do that um, was kind of twofold. One, it was a reaction to a period in time that during the interregnum in uh, the UK when there was a lot of um, things going on in England in terms of um, church uh, heresy, um, a lot of um, things that the folks who were kind of religious rebellion uh, leaders at the time didn't think was great. So they said, you know what, uh, clergy just shouldn't take money. And that will solve the problem of them being uh, beholden to those those powers and principality and, and uh, to mammon. And so um, it has carried on in, in several of those strands of Quakers that I mentioned earlier on that we don't have paid clergy. That's true in my tradition as well. Um, the problem is that even within the tradition themselves, there's a lot of folks who then uh, have associated that strand of thinking with the idea that we shouldn't have ministers because it's not fair if someone um, gets acknowledged as more important than other people. Uh, that misses the boat. Um, my understanding is that ministry doesn't make you more important. Um, it doesn't mark you as somehow special. Uh, it, it, it's just a matter of um, kind of that piece of scripture that the eye doesn't do what the hand does and the foot doesn't do what the elbow does. I think that's how the scripture goes. Anyway, the point is the people who are called to more ministry than other people aren't better ministers or more of a minister than other folks. It's just that what the path is that's been set out for their life is slightly different than some others. That doesn't give them any mark of power, um, I don't think. Or we ought not think that it makes us special somehow if we do feel called into ministry. Ours is the task to stay faithful just like everybody else. Anywho, so um, 
My tradition doesn't ordain, uh, or that's to say, we don't believe that anyone that's human can ordain. The ordination is a sacrament and it's internal. And um, so what we do do is we acknowledge um, when there are gifts of ministry being carried as far as we understand. So um, recently, um, I and, um, and Christina, my wife, who lots of you will know, um, <clears throat> went before New York Yearly Meeting, which is kind of uh, the conference level from other denominations, where we had um, previously met with a regional level and then a, con and then a local congregational level to test our sense, to test our discernment that we are continued uh, or continue to be called to do ministry work. And so there in front of that business meeting, um, friends approved the endorsement of my minute of travel. And so that minute of travel is something that I'll carry with me now when I go to do various pieces of ministry work. And it says in it um, what those friends who were gathered there at that kind of uh, denominational conference level um, gathering, what their sense of me and the ministry I do is, affirmed by the people at the regional level and then again at the local congregation. So it kind of works its way up, and then that letter I carry with me. So if I'm out doing work anywhere, whether it's inside the Religious Society of Friends or outside of it, I'll probably have this minute with me, and I can share it. And that way, folks have a sense of what it is that I'm bringing to the table, and um, I know what it is I'm accountable to, because when I go places, if that letter gets handed over, the folks who are there... Um, end up kind of writing on that letter and sending it back to my congregation so they know what the work is that I'm doing out in the world. Now, it doesn't always happen that people do that. Sometimes it seems like such a bizarre concept uh, that people don't do it or, or it just doesn't happen. But I like the idea. It keeps you grounded to a congregation. And um, the letter itself is pretty powerful. It speaks to an individual as opposed to just kind of a, a giant abstract. Um, and we don't uh, have ordained clergy in, in my tradition. And so this letter letter of travel is, is pretty important. It um, kind of serves to hold me in a relationship with my community and it um, serves to have them acknowledge that there's some gift of God functioning in me um, or uh, attempting to function in me as, as I steward it. So um, please feel free to read those things below. I did want to share the letter because I think it's kind of neat. The link is below uh, immediately so. And if you have any questions about this, please shoot me uh, a, a comment in the comment section below there. Um, I'm particularly interested in hearing if there's other friends um, out there from members of the Religious Society who um, have thoughts or comments about how um, this whole process of, of um, traveling in the ministry and getting a letter of travel works. Uh, I'd like to see some lively conversation. So please feel free to give things a read and um, talk to you soon. Thank <laughs> you.